morning I'll talk about the importance of a spiritual friendship. Uh, sometimes there is quite a bit of a misunderstanding what we mean by spiritual friendship. Uh, some time ago, a few years ago, uh, we have a member by the name of Daniel Huo, very talented uh, composer who wrote a song called Beautiful Friend. Uh, that's supposed to be the translation for Kalyana Mitra. Uh, of course, the song talks about uh, you know, having a good spiritual, uh, being linked up with spiritual friends. But sometimes because of the word beautiful friend, some people think that it's probably a song for somebody that you, you like, <laughs> a beautiful friend. So, so sometimes there's a misunderstanding. So today I'm going to talk about what do we mean by spiritual friendship? How do we go about uh, establishing uh, spiritual friends? And, uh, and, and uh, you know, how can we be uh, good spiritual friends ourselves? So the word spiritual friend comes from the word Kalyana Mitra. Kalyana Mitra is in Pali language and Sanskrit is Kalyana Mitrata. Mitra is uh, Sanskrit, Mitta is um, Pali. So very close. Kalyana could mean lovely, beautiful, and Mitra means a friend. So Kalyana Mitra actually means a good friend, maybe a virtuous friend as well. Noble friend, admirable friend uh, within the Buddhist community. So, really, uh, we don't have such a good English translation to capture the word Kalyana Mitra. You know, so, you've got to use so many words in order to explain uh, Kalyana Mitra. And um, Kalyana Mitra applies not only uh, to the monastics, but also to, to lay people as well. So, this is something that uh, that we should understand who Kalyana Mitras are. And like what Brother Bobby mentioned, that uh, one day the Ananda, uh, who is the Buddha's attendant, uh, was with the Buddha, and he was very, very inspired by the Sangha that, had, that have grown around the Buddha. So they used to travel together, they do retreats together. So Ananda was so inspired that morning. And he mentioned to the Buddha that he thinks, in his own opinion, the spiritual friendship that you have among the members of the Sangha is really fantastic. And he says this is really half of what the spiritual life uh, is, that spiritual life revolves around spiritual friendship. So which means that uh, Ananda has given a lot of importance to spiritual friendship. Half of what the spiritual life is, uh, it surrounds, is connected with spiritual friendship. Uh, but the Buddha corrected Ananda. You know, once in a while, uh, Ananda gets corrected, but uh, it's not nice for Ananda. He gets corrected, but it's because that he's been corrected that that we also learn something. So sometimes it's good that uh, the Buddha makes correction. Uh, the Buddha says, "No, no, don't say that, Ananda. Don't say that. Actually, spiritual friendship is not half of the spiritual life. It's the entire spiritual life." So the Spiritual friendship is so important that it covers the whole spiritual life of the Sangha. It's not half of it. Of course, uh, poor Ananda it gets recorded and everybody knows that Ananda makes a slip <laughs> by saying half a, half a spiritual life. But, you know, we learn from it. And uh, the Buddha also went on to say that a Kalyana Mitra, uh, which covers the entire spiritual life, is about good friendship. A good friendship. You know, you have friends within the community good companionship that you provide each other that kind of support and good comradeship you do things together and uh, that is why Kalyana becomes so important eh? and uh, this is actually what you require if you want to develop and you want to cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path so many people think that by adopting a Buddhist way of life or if a person becomes a monastic it is probably like renouncing living working, uh, practicing silently in the forest, disconnected with others. But there is the other aspect. While that is a way that some people would practice, the Buddha emphasized the importance of having good spiritual friends in order to support your practice, in order for you to make progress on the Noble Eightfold Path. And these come from the Upada uh, Sutta, from the San Nikaya. The Buddha declares, that with regard to external factors, internal factors is of course your cultivation, the effort you put in and, and all that, right? But for as regards to external factors, there isn't 
any one single factor more crucial for the monk's training than spiritual friendship. Wow, so that is the great importance that the Buddha has placed on spiritual friendship. When you talk about external factors, the one most important factor that supports a monk's a training is spiritual friendship. Uh, a monk who is a friend with spiritual people abandons what is unskillful and develops what is skillful. That's the reason. So in the training of a person's spiritual path, in the training of a monk, they, he has to have spiritual friends that helps him to shed off what is unskillful and to pick up and develop uh, skillful uh, uh, speech, thoughts, actions. Uh, there are also seven qualities of, for spiritual progress. In the Sovacca Sutta, Sutta, this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, it mentions about seven qualities for us to make progress. Okay, so all of us joining the Buddhist path, we have taken the uh, three refuges, we are actually on a spiritual path. But what are the qualities that will help us to make progress in this spiritual path? Number one is the respect for the teacher. The teacher is the Buddha. So for us to progress in our spiritual path, the respect for the Buddha, for our teacher. Number two, respect for the Dharma. Yeah, there's, there's the doctrine. Respect for the Buddhist monastics, which is Sangha, so Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Respect for the training. The training that you undergo. If you are going through uh, some uh, training in, the, uh, in your morality or your meditation, you must respect the, 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 the training. Respect for mental training, for the mental cultivation. Willingness to follow the instruction from teachers. Uh, so which means that you're easy to teach. There are some people who are stubborn. Teachers say something, they want to do something else. They want to listen or go against a teacher. So that is really tough to train a person like that. So one of the qualities for spiritual progress is your willingness to follow the instructions that are given you for your teachers. And the seventh quality is having spiritual friends. So you could see that how Kalyanamitra pops up again for our spiritual progress. We need friends. We need spiritual friends. Uh, and uh, in with regards to among spirituality, this is, he needs spiritual friends. The Buddha has given uh, some advice to this bhikkhu, uh, Megaya. Megaya. Now Megaya was, uh, he became a monk and he tried to do meditation to eradicate mental defilements to develop meditation and wisdom. And he kept trying, he went to a quiet place and tried to meditate and all that. But he, he, is, he was very frustrated with it because he doesn't seem to make any progress. So eventually he had to see the Buddha and mention to the Buddha, why is he having problems? He doesn't seem to progress. You're putting the effort, you have to, uh, the place that you're in is really quite nice, quiet and all that. But how come you don't make progress? And the Buddha advised him on five qualities. He says, Number one, uh, Megiya, you need to have good friends, associates and companions. Yeah. Number one, good friendship, spiritual friendship, first quality. And of course, uh, you need to have uh, virtuous behavior uh, that is based on precepts for the monks, they got the Vinaya. And the third is to listen to talks that promote modesty, contentment, effort, virtue, concentration and all that. So you need to have talks that inspires you for Dharma practice. Number four is to abandon unwholesome qualities and develop wholesome qualities. So now you need to make the effort uh, to develop good qualities. And number five, wisdom into the four noble truth. But you see, you could see that amongst the five qualities which the Buddha has given to Bhikkhu Megiya, good spiritual friends is the first quality. It's really important for our progress. Sometimes we do not realize how important where your friends are. And there's another one, uh, another advice about how if a person wants to attend uh, Sotapanna, which is a strip enter, that's the first stage of sainthood in the Buddhist tradition. Number one is association with people of integrity. Again, Kalyana Mitra, top side and number one, the first quality. Okay. Then the hearing of the Dhamma, Saddhamma Savana. Uh, appropriate or wise att uh, attention, this is uh, Yoniso Manisakara, and practice in accordance with the Dhamma, this is uh, Dhammanu Dhamma Patipada. So of these four wholesome uh, practices, first is spiritual friendship. So you see why we need spiritual friends, why we need a fellowship, 
for BJF, we call ourselves a Buddhist a Gems Fellowship, that is for people to come together in, in order to provide support. So if BJF it becomes disharmonious and people come here and have a lot of headaches and problems, <laughs> then we are not providing that support. So we have to create a community whereby people who come in could actually practice the Dharma and with that you support each other. We'll talk about a little bit more about that later on. So spiritual friendship is not only for monks, not only for the monastics, but also for the lay people. So there is this lay person by the name of Dika Jahannu. He has no intention of ever becoming a monk. He's a lay person like all of us here in this hall. Uh, they've got families to look after, have to earn a living and all that. Okay? But he also wants to see how can we make uh, how can we, uh, as a lay person, practice the spiritual life? And the Buddha explains, uh, the Buddha has given several advice in this Dikajana Sutta, it's in under uh, Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, the Buddha also explained in this sutra what spiritual friendship for lay people is like. He says, when a person spends time with other lay people who are advanced in virtue. So that is one thing that we try to associate, spend some time with people who have uh, gone some progress in the path and when you're with them you always feel very inspired you know because of their practice yeah so you need to kind of associate people who inspires you could be lay people not necessary monks and he talks with them engages in discussion and develops strong faith virtue generosity and wisdom by following the examples so when you sit down you don't talk about politics you don't know, about the government and the taxes and the latest budget and the latest uh, whatever, whatever, whatever appears in your WhatsApp. <laughs> you actually begin to talk about Dhamma that can actually inspire. And this is what we mean by associating with wise spiritual people, spiritual friends. Remember, it's like one of the key principal things for us to make progress in, in our spiritual development. So this is spiritual friendship. Association, wise association with other people who have progressed along the path. And when you're with them, spend some time talking about the Dharma and all that. Of course, you can talk about other things, but also make sure that you speak something about Dharma <laughs> and how to practice. Now, when we talk about spiritual friendship, now I find this categorization uh, or classification very useful. This comes from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. And what I'm going to see down here is actually um, taken from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, 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 example. He says that when you talk about spiritual friendship, there are two levels. Uh, one is what we call the horizontal, horizontal spiritual, spiritual friendship. Oh. Uh, horizontal spiritual friendship. This is friendship between friends who are at about the roughly the same level following the path. So this is friendship between partners or peers along the path. So as we uh, continue to uh, grow in our uh, uh, practice, uh, we are with friends, uh, Buddhist friends. There is one which we call the horizontal spiritual friendship. That means we are more or less at about, about the same level. We are peers, we're practicing together. So that is horizontal spiritual friendship. Same level, you don't feel threatened, wow, this person's practice or I, I do not know whether I can match up. It's about the same level, you feel comfortable, you encourage each other. So that is one level, that's horizontal level another level is what you call vertical spiritual friendship all right so vertical spiritual friendship what is this like this is having spiritual friendship with people at different levels of the path so which means that there are some who are higher in their practice and there are some who are just learning so this is what you call the uh, asymmetrical uh, friendship right so the two members are not equal uh, the two uh, so there is some kind of a bonding between them still. There is one who is more junior in the practice and there's one more senior. And the example of this is like uh, between a teacher and a student. Right? So when you have special friends also, are your friends uh, more, if they are more developed than you, then it's more like a vertical relationship. If you're all together at the same path, uh, then you are, there's a horizontal special friendship. I will talk about horizontal friendship first before going over to the vertical friendship okay horizontal friendship is people coming together as friends so why do we want to get together as friends there is something about the human character that we are gregarious sometimes we like association with people sometimes not too much association 
some form of useful association because we like to do things together, we collaborate together, we do things, and therefore able to achieve much bigger things uh, than if you can do by as one person. Like for instance, this big building, it is not done by one person, it is a collaboration uh, working together. But of course, in, you need to have a leader to lead the whole process, yeah, the collaboration. And because of that, uh, the, what we can achieve here in doing this building is beyond what each of us in this committee, building committee, can achieve individually. So the coming together, pulling together, having communication and planning, doing things together, so this is the gregarious part of human nature. And that is why, although uh, within, if you look into nature, we are not the strongest amongst the animals. Actually, there are many animals bigger than us, stronger than us. But because we can work together, and that is why human uh, beings is at the apex of this uh, pyramid. Huh? And the second part could be the element of the basic disposition, uh, right? So uh, that is the, another reason why people get together. So the Buddha actually says that those of inferior disposition come together and unite. So the people who have inferior disposition gang up together. So they go out drinking, they go out gambling, they go out, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things. Because they're of the same nature, they find comfortable and they have a lot of fun among themselves. But they are all of inferior disposition. A person with a superior disposition will not be able to sit into the group. They'll kick him out. <laughs> he becomes the outlier. He's the one who is causing trouble to the group. Yeah. Whereas those with superior disposition would like to gang up together also. Right? So people get together based on their characteristic, based on whether you can click with people and whether you whether you can click with people as as uh, concerns your, your disposition. Okay, so that is one, your disposition. In spiritual friendship, there is dedication to a common teaching, dedication to a common path and practice, and the dedication to similar ideals and uh, aspirations. So when we talk about spiritual friendship, uh, the, the cornerstone of your friendship is that we're all bound together by the same teachings, by the same teacher, by the same practice, by the same ideals. As Buddhists, that's what we do. We have the Buddha as our spiritual ideal, and uh, at the core of our life, we have the Dhamma. Right? And uh, we unite with others with this, on the same spiritual path, uh, because that's the way we gain encouragement, strength, inspiration, in order to encourage each other for the practice. Right? So that's, that, is, that is the thing, our, our horizontal friendship, coming together, uh, being together with the people with the same disposition, having the same goals, supporting each other in the practice. That is a horizontal friendship. So this is when spiritual friendship becomes a common goal, because such friendship helps to transform us and helps us to let go of our attachment and our ego-centered rights. Uh, spiritual friendship is not about satisfying any personal needs, right? Because people have personal needs and sometimes they want to have friends in order to satisfy themselves. It's not like that. It's not even set about satisfying the other person's needs. It's not satisfying trying to satisfy your needs or trying to uh, satisfy the other person's needs. It is actually everybody contributing together in order to uplift each other so that everybody gets closer to the, to, to the Dharma. So it's not I, it's not you, it's we, it's us. All right? So this is the idea. So in spiritual friendship, we are concerned with the other person, not because of the ways the person satisfies us, but because we also want the person to grow, right? So you have that kind of uh, um, motivation to see the other person grow, so that the other person also develop greater wisdom, greater virtue, greater understanding and all that. So that's part of spiritual friendship. You want to encourage each other. So after talking about uh, horizontal friendship, let's go on to the uh, vertical friendship. This is the, when the relationship of the two people are not equal. Uh, but the relationship is, can be mutually beneficial. Uh, both the teacher and the student also have different qualities and they benefit from each other. Of course, the ideal teacher is the one who has uh, a lot of knowledge on the Dharma and maybe a lot of practical experience along the path. And the other thing about the teacher is that the teacher must be willing and eager to teach. Some teachers, uh, uh, they have a lot of practice and knowledge, but they do not know how to teach. 
So uh, it's, it's not easy if you go on a teacher who do not know really how to give instructions or who leave you alone, right? And uh, so he must also be kind and gentle to the students. So there's compassion and all that. But he cannot be too lenient. Like when the student starts making all the music, he should give feedback. So some of the teachers, uh, they don't give feedback and the students go off the track. <laughs> With no feedback, they really go off the track. So the teacher must also be able to give feedback so that uh, the students are on the path. In the case of the students, they must have faith in the teacher to guide them on the spiritual path. And the students should be easy to speak to. This is uh, in Bali, they say, uh, it's easy to speak, easy to instruct. Uh, that is, they have the willingness to follow advice and to learn. Amongst the spiritual friends that we have, uh, the Buddha is said to be our spiritual friend, right? The Buddha said that in this whole world, I'm the supreme spiritual friend of living beings because it is uh, independence upon me by relying on me that those who are subject to birth, old age and death becomes liberated from birth, old age and death. So when we take the Buddha as a spiritual friend, uh, we use the Buddha as a refuge. Through the Buddha, we are able to overcome uh, birth, old age and death. So we can actually achieve spiritual progress by having spiritual friendship with the Buddha. So the Buddha is actually the foremost spiritual friend. And uh, for a Dharma teacher, uh, for us to be uh, spiritual friends or Dharma teacher, you need to have uh, five qualities. You need to speak step by step. You don't actually go into very difficult ideas. And uh, students, when they listen to you, it's like jumping on the deep end of the swimming pool. <laughs> To get lost so good teachers do it by step by step uh, the second quality is that they must explain cause and effect what what causes what what is the effect third is speaking out of compassion dharma must be spoken out of compassion and then when a dharma speaker speaks it's not to get uh, material rewards like getting angpaos or getting presents or getting sponsorship or getting rich donors not like that it is uh, to speak not for the purpose of material rewards and uh, speak without hurting yourself and others so this this comes from uh, one of the sutras that the buddha mentioned so if you want to be dharma teachers uh, there are some qualities that you need to observe to speak the dharma you have to do it in gradually sequentially you explain what the cause and effect and very importantly is the compassion you must speak in order to benefit your listeners you, there must be the kindness in your heart of wanting to help the other person. You see what is the problem and you want to help the other person to overcome the problem. So this is one of the qualities of a teacher. Sometimes teachers are pretty nasty. For me also, I've gone through, especially when you're primary school, some of the teachers are very hard. Some of them, they beat up students. <laughs> some of them could be downright cruel. They would like to see cruel, the students suffer, like the pinching and all that, you know, because those days, uh, we don't take things uh if you get punished by your teacher you go back and complain your parents parents say you deserve it because you're naughty but don't try this these days <laughs> these days and if the teacher lays hands on the kids uh, uh, the teacher could get into some serious trouble yeah. so sometimes teachers as there are some teachers who don't have very because of their frustration and all that they take it on the kids but i i also i'm sure you also have very good teachers teachers that you admire them for their consistency, for how they teach and how they inspire the students. Yeah. And it's because of that, even if you cannot do maths very well, because of this issue, you are able to get A for your maths, for instance. So these are the teachers that, that have actually, uh, you know, so they, they are teachers who, who are very competent, they teach out of that kind of compassion. They really want to share it with you. They really want to make you improve yourself. So when we teach a Dharma, that is what we should try to do to encourage you, yeah? and uh, you speak without hurting others or yourself. And uh, so those are just the uh, quotations that we have from the Pali canon itself. But there are also some other uh, uh, sources that we can take, uh, which are not directly from the Pali canon, and it's not from the sutras, but it's still within the Buddhist tradition. Uh, there are two uh, treatises here. One is called the Muti Magda. This is the first century uh, common era. Uh, this is, we don't say AD, we say CE. 
okay the multi mark and uh that's the first century work the sudi marga is the fifth century work okay uh first century work with the multi marga is written by he was the one who put it together arahan upatissa he says that uh kalina mitra is needed to develop excellent samadhi so i guess this is when people want to develop meditation you do it together with some friends and then you encourage each other for your samadhi to be excellent it's not like just going alone and locking yourself up somewhere uh, you have a friend to work with to practice together and he says that among the some seven qualities of a good spiritual monk friend this is among the monks eh? they are lovable they're actually nice <laughs> And you have a friend that is nice, you actually like him and worthy of esteem, someone that you also respect. The way he carries himself, his discipline and all that. Venerable, he's, he carries himself in a very responsible manner. Ability to counsel well. So if you have issues, they can, he can counsel you. Patience in listening. So he, if you have some issues, you can talk to him and he's, he's willing to listen to his patient. And then when asked, he can deliver deep teachings. He can actually say certain things that you have not heard before. Deep teachings. And they're not engaged in trivial matter. Not trivial in nature, but a personal substance. So when you have a friend like this, wow, this friend, you can work together. And that's how your meditation can actually develop. This is the advice to monks. It comes from the Mutimaga, one of the treaties, uh, commentaries on how to cultivate uh, liberation in Mutimaga. The path of uh, liberation. Then in the fifth century, there was this monk from South India by the name of Buddha Gosha. Later on, he landed on Sri Lanka. He wrote a treatise called the Shuddhi Marga. There's a path of purification. And he says that you need a Kalyana Mitra to give you a good meditation uh, subject. So this is probably a teacher, meditation teacher, who is also your spiritual friend. And he chooses a meditation subject that's suitable for you. These days, we try to make things in the, uh, so systematized that we tend to give the same methods to everybody. So that if you want to learn meditation, there's a certain way of practice. You use a certain object and then you use that for practice. But actually, there are many um, variations of the object that might work better. During the Buddhist time, there was this um, young monk who I think, I'm not sure who his teacher was, but one of this uh, very renowned teacher could be like Sariputta or, you know, so he, this young monk started practicing meditation, but he doesn't seem to make any progress at all. And you get frustrated because sometimes when you meditate, you try and try and you don't make progress and your mind starts going to sleep, your mind starts running all over and you get so very frustrated with yourself, right? So sometimes uh, as a monk, they get so frustrated that they say, oh, yeah, I think I better disrupt lah. <laughs> don't become monk so difficult. I don't think I can meditate at all. So it's a good thing that this monk uh, met up with the Buddha. And when the Buddha saw this young monk, straight away the Buddha knew that the object of meditation that was given by his teacher was not the right one. So the Buddha gave him a unique meditation method that is not actually being used for the other monks. What the Buddha asked him to do was to meditate on a, 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 on a golden lotus. So he was just to kind of visualize that was a gold, a lotus, all in gold, brilliant, shining gold so this monk when he's given this uh, meditation object by the buddha wow he was all happy he sat down and straight away wow the object was so good his mind just completely zoomed into this object and lotus so he looked at the how beautiful this golden lotus is shining brilliant and as he began to meditate more and more in this golden lotus eventually he says hey how come this lotus the patterns are becoming tarnished right so instead of the bright gold it's beginning to change color now. And then later on, the, the petals on the gold lotus started falling. And then when the petals are fallen, then this man started to realize about the impermanence of everything. And he actually uh, became a saint. And the Buddha explained uh, later on why he has given a golden lotus to this young man. Actually, this young man, before becoming a man, he, was, he came from a family of goldsmiths. So in India, there are some families that specializes in certain trades and his family specializes in gold, trading, uh, making ornaments of gold. So he also grew up being trained to handle gold. 
So he's got a lot of affinity with gold. But that is not the only life that he was, has affinity with gold. Before that, he was born in the same family and he died in the same family dealing with gold. For seven generations, he was in the same family dealing with gold. So you could see because of his uh, affinity with the subjects, when he's given a golden lotus, straight away he could actually meditate. So this is, of course, uh, in the case of the Buddha, he could actually immediately see what is suitable for this uh, young man and gave him a meditation method that really works. Right? So if you can have a teacher like that, wow, I superb. If not, try, try your best to get, uh, you need to hunt around for something for a good teacher whom uh, you can work along with you. Because sometimes when you go for retreats, sometimes the teachers, uh, maybe the way he teaches, the way he instructs you might not actually be so suitable also. So uh, uh, for you to be comfortable and to learn from somebody, you must uh, be able to say, okay, this method, the way the teacher teaches is uh, very good for me. So that is, that is, uh, that is how a Kalyanamitra is really important for us also to make progress. Uh, this comes from uh, this, uh, Vimuti Marga and Vishuddhi Marga. There is in the Anguttara Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya means a numbered saying. So, so there are the groups of, of books of one, books of two. So all the tools, um, two aspects will, uh, will be collected in this book. They are all two, 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 two. Or book of three, they are all three, two, three, three, three. Okay. So this is the group of seven. Uh, book of seven. It's called the Mitta Sutra. Uh, we know the Metta Sutra. There's Mitta. Mitta means friend. Huh? Uh, it talks about the seven characteristics of a good friend. A good friend is one who gives what is hard to give. Okay. What is hard to give? And he does what is hard to do. He's able to take the trouble to do what he did. He endures what is hard to endure. And if he has secrets, he tells you about his secrets. But when you share your secret with him, he doesn't share your secret with other people. He, you know. <laughs> okay? And he doesn't abandon you in misfortune. And when you're down and out, he doesn't look down on you. So these are good friends. Do you have good friends like that in your life? Are you also a good friend? Do you have these characteristics? Or are you opposite of all this? So sometimes it's good for us to think. So these are characteristics of good friends, eh? from the Mitta Sutta. Uh, then when we talk about friendship, there is one the favorite sutra that people used to refer to. It's called the Sigala Vada Sutta. Sigala was a young man. Father was a strong supporter of the Buddha and the Sangha. But as a young man, he was not interested. He doesn't want to meet up with the Buddha. He doesn't want to meet up with the monk. A young man, huh? he wants to enjoy with his friends and have a good time. Poor father was quite rich. Huh? So father tries to bring him to the monastery to meet the Buddha. He doesn't want to do that. So what to do? So one day when the father was, got sick and was passing away, father made him promise that when he passes away, uh, young Sigala has to bow in six directions. That is to buy, bow in the, uh, the four directions, cardinal direction, north, east, south, west, and also uh, the Nadir means the, the bottom, right at the bottom, and also the Zenith, which is at the top. So there are six, six directions. So after the uh, Sigala actually promised to the father that he would do that. So when the father passed away, so Sigala in the morning would wash himself, and then uh, in the east, rising sun, pay us back to all the different directions, six directions. But I didn't know what it means. He just paid because he, he made a promise to the father. And the Buddha also knew that uh, the Sigala uh, born in a wealthy family. He doesn't look after him. He's going to have a lot of trouble in his life. So the Buddha actually looked, looked up for him <laughs> and met him praying in the six, six, seven directions. So the Buddha came to him and said, do you know what you're doing? What is the meaning of all this? The Buddha says, no, I actually don't know. But this is my promise to my father, so that's why I'm doing it. So the Buddha gives different interpretation. When you respect to the ease, it means, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, certain directions uh, refer to a uh, certain uh, relationship. And one of the relationships is amongst friends. And so the Buddha has given uh, Sigala some advice to friends. In this uh, Sigala Vata Sutta, the Buddha actually talked a lot about bad friends. Who are the bad friends? Friends who make you lose your money, who, uh, who uh, flatter you, who mislead you, uh, who uh, backstab you. 
uh, because uh, Shigala also hangs around with people who are friends who are like that. So Buddha has given a warning. These are the people that can make you lose your money and cause you a lot of trouble. And then the Buddha also mentioned who are the, who are the good friends. So I'll just mention about some of the characteristics of good friends. And uh, there are four types of friends. And then we can actually see that we have, if our friends have these qualities and whether as a friend, we also have these qualities. So can you recognize yourself in these qualities? All right, as a friend. There are so four types of friends. The first type is called a helpmate. Mm, a friend who's out to, to help, help me. Second is a friend who is very sympathetic. So they are the same in happiness and in sorrow. They share your feelings. They, are, uh, they know how you feel and they also share with your feelings. Third is a wise friend who offers you good counsel, who offers you good advice. And number four is the sympathetic friend, a friend who is sympathetic. Okay? And the Buddha also elaborated in each of these type of friend. What, do you, what are the characteristics when you say help me? Okay, help me. What is a help me? He actually guards his friends when the friend is heedless. Because sometimes uh, you are careless. Or sometimes you go to a place and you get really excited and you forget about your things. So these are the friends who, who guard you, who look after you. Like for instance, you go to another country, you want to take pictures running here there, but you leave your hand back behind. So she's the one who actually look after your hand back. Make sure that you are, you are not gone overboard. Okay? So it kind of, when you're heedless, when you're careless, he's the one who actually backs you up, who looks after you. And also, so another thing is the protect the wealth of the heedless. Sometimes you get excited, you want to overbuy, especially when you get a credit card, they charge everything to the credit card. And some of the things are very bad buys. You go to the tourist uh, kind of thing, they overcharge because they have to pay the tourist guy and they give them commission. So these things you buy in the shop, so expensive, probably the tourist guy. You go to the next shop, actually, it's so much cheaper. So this is a friend say, hey, hey, don't buy it. This one, the price is, is too much. Don't buy it. Be careful. So he's the one who actually protects you uh, when you're heedless. And a refuge when the friend is in danger. So he becomes like a kind of refuge. When uh, you're in danger, you can go to him and he'll be there to kind of protect and help you out. And when help is needed, what do you need? Oh, you need this. Uh, he gives you twice the amount. He doesn't try to say, hey, less can or not. He doesn't only give you what you report, but he gives you much more so that, so that you have really enough. So these are the characteristics of help me, help friend. That is the first characteristic. One group of friends help me. You have friends like that? Are you also like that? Are you a good friend? Are you a good help me? Do you have these characteristics? You guard your friend, look after your friend, protect their wealth. And when your friend is in danger, you are down there to like support and you give help. Not only the help they require, but you give more than what is required. All right. Number two is a friend who shares your happiness and sorrow. So you have ups and downs. Okay. So he will share his secrets with you. Because if you're really close, then you're not threatened by each other. Then you can actually tell each other about each other's secrets, right? But when you tell your secret to your friend, he will conceal. He will not uh, uh, tell other people about your secrets. And he does not forsake you in your misfortune. He does not abandon you when things are not turning well for you. He doesn't walk away, leave you to yourself. You know? He doesn't do that. Not a good friend. Huh? And he's prepared to make sacrifices for the friend. He's prepared to take the extra trouble and make the sacrifice on your behalf. So this is the one who shares your happiness and your soul. There's a second group of friends. Third is this wise friend who offers you good counsel and points out what is good. So uh, he restrains his friends from doing evil. So sometimes again, callousness or sometimes being misled by other people. You do things that are, that are not good, that does not create a good karma. So they will actually tell you, uh -uh, don't do this, it's not good, avoid this. He encourages his friends to do good. When there are opportunities to do good, he will encourage you to do good. 
he informs his friends what he doesn't know so he also becomes like a source of knowledge pointing out to new things for the friend and he also points the path to heaven how to practice a good uh, life so that eventually the friend could land up in heaven good friend <laughs> show you how to go to heaven maybe you go to heaven you meet him also that hey you're here <laughs> you go to the same heaven make sure you stay in the same district also <laughs> And then the fourth is a sympathetic friend. Uh, a sympathetic friend is a friend who has got a heart for you. He doesn't rejoice when you're facing a misfortune. When you're facing a misfortune, you're very sympathetic. He feels for you. And when you're prospering, he uh, rejoices in your prosperity. When you do well, he rejoices. An enemy opposite, uh, the characteristic of enemy. Uh, when you're rejoicing, when you're misfortune, wow, he feels happy. <laughs> When you are prospering, he feels jealous. That is the, the other part, that's the earlier part. Huh? The enemies in the guise of friends. But a good friend, a sympathetic friend, is the one who do not rejoice in your misfortune, who rejoices in your prosperity. And when others speak ill of you, he will actually stop them. He will correct them. Say, actually, you're not like that. That's a misunderstanding. He supports you. And when others talk well of you, he praises his support. Yeah, 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 my the friend is like that. So these are all the good things uh, of a friend. This is what you call a sympathetic friend. So the take home message is that uh, these are four categories of friends. A friend who is a helpmate, uh, a friend who is uh, a friend in happiness and woe or in sorrow, a friend who gives you good counsel, and a friend who is sympathetic. So really, um, this is like cherishing and valuing a friend in a manner that a mother cherishes her own child. And there's a lot of love in your heart for your friend, right? for a person to have all these characteristics. Now, let me just talk about the Plum Village. Uh, it's something that I've read. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a teacher from uh, this Plum Village who talks about how uh, the need for building up a spiritual friendship. He says a community creates core friendship together. So a community, a spiritual community, you must build a community with friendship as a core. And uh, you practice every day. But I think in the Plum Village, what they do, they also share the fruits of their daily practice with their, with their members. So there's all of this sharing. Not only do you practice, but you share about your, the fruits of your practice. And the analogy that he has given is that the Sangha is like a solar system. Okay? So the core friendship is at the center, it's like a bright sun. And uh, as a bright sun, it radiates warmth, light, as well as the gravitational force to bring everybody together within the orbit. Right? So at the core is friendship. Yeah? And that is what they, they practice in the farm village. And the power of friendship lies in the depth of the spiritual friendship and harmony. So harmony is really important. Even like in Bijab itself, it's always emphasized why harmony is important. Because if the members are not harmonious, even if you have a, a you know, dazzling account, you run all kinds of activities and people come in and they get disharmonious, that's not a spiritual community. So one of the important characteristics that, that we, it is an ongoing work that we have to do, make sure that the fellowship is harmonious. People, are, you know, you don't, you don't create disharmony, creates a lot of tension and anger inside the community. So the power of a friendship depends on the spiritual friendship and harmony. Uh, much is not the number of people. When people say, oh, what is the size of BJF? It's not like, oh, we got like 10,000 members, 20,000, 100,000, not like that. It is the quality of the friendship that you have to do. That is more important. And that friendship must embody safety. You feel safe within the community. And there is some form of intimacy that you can actually get close to each other without feeling threatened. And there's also compassion. So that is, that is what a good spiritual community is like. And that also provides the environment for people to grow. Venerable Chinya Han uh, introduced a practice called the second body practice. I also didn't know what there was this until I was doing some research and saw that he introduced a second body practice. I'll explain to you what the second body is. It's quite interesting. Um, in this practice, of course, everybody looks after themselves. 
So we care for ourselves, we attend to ourselves. So this is the first body. The body that you have is your call, your first body. This is your first body. So you look after your body. But besides having the first body, you have a second body. And what is the second body? The second body is uh, for a participant. That somebody who wants to become a second body, they agree to be second body to somebody else. In other words, more like a body, eh? second, second body. Uh, whom uh, the participant will be given a friend whom they can actually care for, and they, uh, they try to forge some kind of close relationship. So, okay, so when you have that, then the, within the Sangha, in the plant village, you have this uh, body system, people looking up each other. When somebody is sick, the second body will come and just maybe sit down and keep provide company, see what they need in the space, so making the other person feel very comforted and comfortable. This is what they have the plum village. Second body having this kind of body to support each other. And actually, it's not that you need to change everybody within the Sangha. Actually, according to Varun if you can have this kind of relationship, close relationship with, it, with people like this, it creates a circular chain of friendship within the Sangha. The Sangha, uh, according to Varun Chikahan, is not only the ordained Sangha. It also includes the lay people. So we talk about Biko, Bikune, and then Upasika and Upasaka. So uh, the, four, the four groups. So even the lay people themselves, we are a Sangha. So uh, this is what they have by pairing with one another and supporting each other. And after a while, they change. <laughs> it's this way. So you look after somebody else or so. Yeah. So this, this sounds like good. And uh, how do they practice this? When you practice this, there's a practice with lightness. It's not like very serious, very intense second body, then oh, it becomes too difficult for the other person to handle. You, uh, you do it in a kind of a light way. You don't try to be like somebody's therapist or somebody's guru. Whoa. It's too overbearing, <laughs> second body. It's more like a friendship, light, uh, light friendship, that association. The intention of this practice is to pull us out from our habitual self-interest, from our busyness and isolation from others. Sometimes we tend to be isolated from others. Sometimes we are too concerned about our own needs and our own interests. We forget about other people. So you can, you, even if you're in a group of people, you don't care about others. You just become aloof, right? So the purpose of this practice is to pull you out from that in order that there is somebody, someone else that you care for. Uh, you know, that, that you, you have this maintain this relationship. And uh, so you have a spirit of more openness and connection, uh, giving you more encouragement, and spending more time with one another. And this, is, this is done as a kind of a, as a practice. Huh? And um, so every week, at least they spend some time together. Uh, and, and this goes beyond a typical connection. So uh, it is said that you don't have to improve your relationship with everyone uh, for the fellowship to bloom within the Sangha. When you care for one person, you care for the whole. So that is the idea. This is a second body practice. Idea is that the caring, uh, the interchange, you feel uh, that you are very, very well supported. It's important for any uh, spiritual group. It's so important for us also as we share something that we can learn. Yeah? And uh, another teacher, Venerable Shankara Shuta, uh, British teacher, uh, prolific writer, writes very well. He's a really intellectual monk, but he's already passed away. Uh, this is about the relationship with teachers and fellow practitioners. Uh, Venerable Shankara Shuta emphasizes a lot on human communication and friendship. Because even in, uh, he has established different communities uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, but his main base is in Britain, where there are certain communities. And uh, some of them live together in that uh, Dhamma house and they try to practice together. The important part is the human communication and friendship. Uh, this is important because Venerable Sangharaj says is that in our modern society, we tend to be fragmented. People tend to live isolated from one another. That's why having good, a positive communication is important. He believes that our relationship with teachers and fellow practitioners must be honest 
and must be clearly communicated. So honest communication with your teacher. And through friendship, we can develop the virtues of generosity, compassion, patience, and forgiveness. So uh, we need friends in order to cultivate other qualities as well. Because some of these qualities you cannot develop alone. You need other people to practice this quality. And a spiritual community should be a network of friendship. So when you talk about spiritual community, you, you must be based on friends. So some concluding remarks. For a spiritual friendship to be profitable and fruitful in one's spiritual journey, mere association is not enough. You have to go more than a mere association. You have to develop spiritual friendship. Second is we must learn from spiritual friends and identify their positive qualities. So we need to have some good friends and especially vertical spiritual friendship where you also associate not only horizontal, which is very comfortable for us, you also need people who are more advanced in the practice in order to learn from them. And once you cultivate these qualities and work earnestly for us to eradicate our mental departments and cultivate the neighborhood. So for us to progress on the journey, spiritual friends are really important. So that is my talk on Kalyana Mitra. Now, do you have a clearer idea what a Kalyana Mitra is? Yeah? Yeah. Okay.